it's a boring topic, so I'm glad that uh, nobody came for it. Um, and uh, the, the one thing that I do, uh, I, I, can, I, I like to make fun of myself. So uh, it, it, let's, let's have a good time and uh, go for it. Are we good on video or whatever? Oh, no. Whatever. All right, cool. My, my, my buddy Adrian, he, he helps me out. So uh, my name is Evan Davison. Um, this is kind of an update on a talk that I gave last year um, called Dungeons and Dragons, Siege Warfare, and Fantasy Defense in Depth. And it really took a turn uh, in the middle of it that had absolutely nothing to do with Dungeons and Dragons. And we were talking about escalation of warfare. And so I'm going to do a real quick uh, recap of that here at the beginning. But uh, these are a few of my favorite things. Um, I work at a big name vendor um, that, I, that you can find out. Uh, I like to break stuff. So uh, if you get a chance, check out my blog. Uh, from time to time, I have time to post of the fun stuff that I break, like magic on the right. Um, one of the talks that I've got coming up uh, in October is uh, Hacker Halted in Atlanta, talking about how to uh, take over the United States Emergency Alert System. So if you're uh, interested in that, um, it's rather interesting. Uh, some other stuff that's coming up, DerbyCon, SkydogCon, some of those other ones. So um, what I figured we'd do is we'd start, especially for those of you that, haven't, uh, that weren't here last year, to check out, uh, to kind of recap some of the stuff and go back in time. And if the theme of Austin Powers is not, uh, you know, interesting to you, um, I guess I can try to get a little bit more animated or something. And, you know, groovy baby. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but uh, last year we sacrificed this dude called Admin Dude, and uh, we kind of talked about how, as security professionals, we can deploy tons and tons of stuff and you know try to implement defense in depth and all these types of things, but. Ultimately, the failure is to recognize that um, information warfare is an escalating type of thing. And so if we, um, if we take into account um, all these different things that we do, like we study uh, the past of information warfare or the history of warfare, we see that defenses are meant, meant to be overran, um, that there's this escalation of arms that happens and things like that, and the progression of warfare from physical defensive tech, you know, tactics and things like that into... Um, information warfare and all that other type of stuff. And so what we're really, what we learned last year is that we're fighting this lesson of futility that we can't keep the bad guy out of our networks. We can't keep the, you know, in general, the internet isn't a safe place. Anybody disagree? No. Yeah, throw something back at me, all right? Like physically, you know, verbally, whatever. Um, keep yourselves awake, entertain yourself however you can. Um, so ultimately what the talk was about was this this progression of things. And so um, some key concepts I want to kind of key in on before we get into the absolute like mind numbingness of, of an encryption framework that we're going to talk about here. Uh, and open, let's kind of get this concept. So in the beginning, when we first started to get into, um, we first started to get the interwebs uh, of sorts. We wanted connectivity. Um, that was that was what everybody clamored for, right? You wanted access to the internet. You wanted access to the information, that type of stuff. And then as time has gone on, it's become a little bit less about connectivity. We expect connectivity wherever we go. We go to a hotel, we expect there to be internet. We go to uh, you know a coffee shop, we expect there to be internet. Then it became about connectedness, which is this concept of that I want my data wherever I am. So I want to be on my smartphone and have the same PDF file that I have on this other device as I have on this other one, and that everything syncs, and you get into this concept of pervasive ubiquity, which is kind of this next step, this next evolution of, of where the internet is going, which devices are aware of each other and devices connect to each other, just like your laptop connects and they share bandwidth and they do all these crazy things. And, and some of this stuff is largely theoretical, but the idea comes into that, you know, that devices don't have to, that, that we're going to move away from this aspect of having connectivity, that devices will become much more connected. And we have this concept of, like I said, connectedness where, um, things will continue to um, help each other out, if that makes sense, that your data will be all over the place and that it will exist in the cloud or wherever it is. And so, again, why is this important? So as we, as we continue to move forward and as we start to see stuff, we have this concept, some of these concepts, I'm going to move this mic around because I keep turning my head. Uh, we have this concept of some of these things that are coming into play, like software-defined networking where, uh, and, and application networking where Things aren't interacting anymore in this concept of like physical data interchange. This is stuff that's happening at layers of the OSI stack that 
device that regardless of where they are, that devices become directly connected to each other or directly aware. So even between, like when you think about Amazon, AWS, and all these other types of services, you allow data to interact in a like in a memory layer, right? So that things are much more, you know, we don't have to go up and down physical connections between servers. That we can, how can we virtualize this this concept? So you you start to get what I call like a memory hub of sorts, you know, like where you have memory shared across. Anybody follow me on that? Big concept. I don't know. Um, I'm not an expert on it. Uh, some of the this is I call this my buzzword slide. I guess you know the Internet of Things. Zero infrastructure, borderless networks, IPv6, all these different things, like the concept that they're introducing is that everything is always connected. Um, we're seeing this disintegration. Last year we talked about the erosion of the perimeter. So this concept of a border that you can protect, this concept of a defense in depth mechanism that you can employ to keep the bad guy out, that there's some delimiter or some line that you can lay out in the sand that says this is mine and that is yours, is completely obscured. And if it doesn't absolutely fail to exist anymore. And so, this, this gets even further into things like when we talk about our data. So we talk about where we're storing our data, like iCloud, the new, uh, what is it, OSX? I haven't played with it yet, but uh, you know, it's, iCloud is directly integrated into it, so your data is synchronized, and you, know, you can fire up your iPad and have the same documents in all these different places. Your services like Dropbox and so forth, um, you know, this, this line of what is the file system now is completely obscured. There, we're not even talking about like what, is a, you know, what is an asset and what is a... Uh, physical connection between two devices, you're talking about file systems now become virtually connected wherever they are, and, and now you have uh, um, this, this aspect of virtual connectedness that didn't exist before that our current defense mechanisms don't really deal with very well. Um, so let's, let's take a moment to, to reflect on all of that. And uh, Mr. Bigglesworth, nobody. It's okay to laugh, people. If you don't laugh, I'm going to cry. So, Adrian will come console me later. Um, so last year, some of these slides were from last year. So if you if you if you saw this pr presentation last year, all like one and a half of you, um, yeah, because the other one never mind. Um, half of me, because now I'm mentally brain dead. Um, security in the current context of things equals harding devices. That, and deploying products, right? We, we implement solutions, we draw our boundaries around things, we have our firewalls, we have our IDSs, we have these things, yeah, you know, there are more modern approaches and, and you're gonna hear some great things if you're here for Black Hat and DEF CON, all that stuff, there's all sorts of great stuff that happens in those areas, but ultimately those are stop gaps, just like um, the concept of building a castle ultimately became, you know, inferior because they realized that the resources and the assets that made the castle possible were outside of it, and then if you hold up inside of it, you don't really get the benefit of it anymore. You know, ultimately, economically, things start to fail. So that was kind of a concept of last year. And we we're talking about this. Like I said, you're not able to draw a perimeter because the the benefits of having that perimeter ultimately undermine the the benefits of um, keeping things open. And so this is kind of a, a current type of aspect of it. You know, we keep the bad guys out. Therefore, our data is confidential and you know, we clean up after something happens, so we can kick the bad guys out. But one of the concepts that was introduced last year was, and, and this is something that's starting to gain traction in a lot of uh, uh, academic circles or even, even from secure, us as security professionals, we talk about that we're having to deal with states of continuous compromise, right? That, that even if we kick one bad guy out, just another bad guy gets in, or maybe we never get rid of them, maybe it's just, you know, we don't even know that they're there, or whatever that, that may mean to you. So. Something that's a little bit more realistic is, is that security really is about minimizing data exposure. Um, so, you know, can I keep things into a perimeter? Well, maybe, maybe not, but that may be one methodology, that, that avoidance, you know, type of risk management practice. That if I can encrypt my data, protect my devices, and, and prepare for an inevitable, inevitable reach, it's a little bit more proactive. And the reality is that, that, that it's, not a, it's not any one thing, but a combination of multiple things. And so what I need is something that allows me to keep that data exposure to a minimum, that allows me to effectively encrypt and protect my devices, and, and gives me some mechanism to defend my data or defend things when the inevitable breach does happen. And so um, the way that this kind of started out was, you know, just like... Um, how do we do this, right? Like, okay, we're talking about a bunch of different concepts kind of strung together. Evan's not making any sense in the world. 
Um, and, and that's kind of how it started last year. We were looking at this and we were, as we were studying the defensive networks and, and kind of trying to bring you guys something of meaning to talk about was, what does this look like? I mean, how do, how do we really do this? How do we defend ourselves? How do we uh, create something? Why is what we have now not working? Or what does work versus what doesn't? And maybe we're just, do, are we doing this the right way? Or are we just doing this completely incorrectly? And the answer is, I have no idea. Um, you know, it, it, the answer is different for every single organization, and it depends on what you're trying to defend. But we, we kind of looked at it at an aspect of like, what do we have out there already? And so, one of the things that I'll kind of that we introduced last year was this concept of uh, I won't say introduced this concept uh, that is completely false, um, but borrowed this concept of uh, uh, for this what we're calling kind of presentation layer six and a half, and I'll get into more of why it is that in a minute. Um, is that security is three D, and so we showed this. This is a, a slide that I stole directly from last year, so that I had to make one less slide. Um, saved me all of five minutes, but awesome because uh, it was five minutes I needed, is that, and I'm going to let this kind of warp your mind for a minute, but that all of these things are competing with each other for security. So you have, um, you know, transmission storage and processing, how data is interacted with. You have the, the basic CIA triad of, uh, you know, um, information security, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Uh, and then other places where information security is implemented. So you have technology and policy and process and, and the human element of things. And so as we, last year we kind of looked at this and said, what, what do we really have now? If we look at the existing mechanisms that are out there to, um, of how my data interacts or how I interact with my data, what's realistic? And so we've kind of got transmission covered. You know, we've got SSL and VPNs and all these cool technologies that are out there. And we've kind of got it from a technology perspective, and we've, that gives us some confidentiality, it gives us some level of integrity. So I'm not going to go through all the examples, but you can kind of see how all these things compete with each other. And so ultimately, like, some of those squares could be green, you know, in one direction, but any of the other directions can completely negate them. So what, what is realistic? We look at this and it's like, we're never, how can you get this to all green? Because obviously humans have not yet learned how to read encrypted data. And then if we did at that point, it, if it was human readable in some way, it probably wouldn't be encrypted anymore. Um, so that in the inevitable piece of this is that the, the weakest point in any type of security element is the human element. And there's an, you know, we're not going to get around that. So how do we get as close to this as possible? Um, is this even realistic? Well, you know, let's let's explore it a little bit more and find out. Uh, so let's let's explore um, encryption and technology from the perspective of the stack. Uh, so we have the OSI model, which is the most commonly accepted. Um, you also have the TCP/IP model, which kind of lumps together applications. Become you know the session presentation and application layer becomes the most important part of that. Um, and then you have what I call the software developer model. And any software developers in the room? Software people, software writers, there's a few of you. This is not meant to be an insult in any way, shape, or form. But what I've kind of seen is like the per pervasive piece of this is that you interact with APIs. And APIs allow you a simple mechanism to not have to write quite as much code. And that allows you more reliable services, much better functioning applications, and so forth. But what they usually do is they provide you some level of you know these services that you can then write applications on top of. So you can select um, your presentation layer formats, whether it be Java and other things, and Java provides you with you know, JBoss to drop your Java applets into, and that gives you web services and all those types of things. And so, but as we start to think about this, you know, and as we think about the apps that you have on your phone, you're not thinking about devices and other things that are below them anymore. De software developers are not thinking about those things. They're trying to write code that's going to work pervasively across all of those things. They want, it to, they want to write one application that works on your iPhone, that works on your laptop, that works on your Linux box, that works on everything else. And so we have this ubiquity aspect that's coming into play and, and how we're beginning to have this shift from how we like I said, this connectedness to, or connectivity to connectedness, where we had to write applications uh, in this format where they could, they understood that there were services and layers below them to provide interaction with other hosts. And now we've got where applications are now interacting directly with each other because it's ubiquitous to the device. And so this kind of enters into the, to the viewpoint of where we're going to take the rest of the discussion, which is, 
that as devices become less and less important, they, I mean, and that's to say that they are important, but, but as they become less and less of the focus where I can take my data across anything that I'm on and as I uh, no longer care about you know, how I'm accessing this data, but the fact that I have access to it. Anybody following me here still? Like, who's asleep? Awesome, cool. Um, I, nobody's thrown anything yet. I'm really surprised. Um, should we move on? Yeah. Um, ah, yeah. Should we, yeah, I, I'm, I'm used to a little bit, like, feistier crowd. Like, you suck! Yeah, they were, yeah, where are those rockets thing? I, that, that's, that provide a quick moving target. Yeah, that, that, I gotta watch out for that one. Um, so it looks like my slide is all jacked up on this one, but nice, awesome. All right, I'm just going to flip through this because my transitions are totally jacked up. Um, so, so if we look at like encryption and how it's applied, um, back up a little bit there. Sweet. Okay. Um, so let's talk about encryption for a minute. Um, anybody know where the where encryption lies in the OSA, OSI model? Anybody? Okay, and I'm kind of giving away some different stuff here, but, but where does encryption really lie? So you're seeing some, some protocols and stuff there. Um, I, I kind of started asking this question last year of some, some security practitioners, and I because I honestly didn't know the answer to the question, but I was like, where does encryption really lie? Because you, know, it's, you, know, you hear about all these different encryption protocols and stuff like that, but anybody want to take a guess what layer? Um, yeah, a little bit all of them, but there is a right answer, because it only exists at one layer. Even in all of these protocols, encryption, the encryption application, or like encryption itself, only lies at one layer, sure. Wrong. It is the presentation layer, okay? And why? That makes perfect sense, right? When we start to think about it, why does it exist at the presentation layer? You're taking data, you know, clear text, putting it into cipher text, and you have to render it, right? That's what the presentation layer is about, is taking data that's in one format and putting it into another one that's readable by another application and so forth, it, so when we look at this, when we talk about standards, the only place that encryption is really supposed to lie is in the presentation layer. And that's because whatever encryption algorithm that we're using to encrypt, it is a presentation layer format. So you have AES and, you know, I, I put FIPS in here, but it, these are about standards. These are about algorithms and, and mechanisms to uh, render clear text into cipher text and back again. But when we look at this, we're we're looking at all this stuff and we're like, well, wait a minute, well, what does that, like, why is, at layer two, I've got PPTP and L2TP and, you know, at layer three, I've got IPsec and all this other type of stuff. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that when you interact with encryption at that layer, you're really interacting, it's, it's really a going up the stack and coming back down. What's happening is that, you know, whatever vendor or device or whatever thing you have has an application that's running in the background that's taking that data, running it up the stack and bringing it back down again. Um, so, when we start to look at this stuff, you know, we start to, you know, obviously this is working right. Uh, obviously these, these mechanisms, these implementations have never been messed with and nobody has ever pwned them. Okay. <laughs> and <laughs> fail. Um, so, you know, they've never been man in the middle. They never, you know, so why, why are these getting, you know, why, what makes these applications vulnerable? Like why, or what makes these, these, these different protocols and different things vulnerable, different things? Well, they provide, you know, each of them provides their own layer of protection and each of them is used and, and has some different means where it's, it's the right thing to do. So I probably should have put this slide before the last one. But uh, so in the OSI model, encryption equals presentation. If we look at the TCP IP model, encryption is in this application layer. So when we talk about how developers implement it, it's a little bit less clear you know, cut and clear. And so what I'm trying to, trying to show you guys is that the reason that we're getting that these overall encryption is either A, difficult to implement, or B, easy to get around or, you know, to, to attack in, in many instances is because there, there's this challenge of like, where does it really exist? So in reality, what we see is instead of it existing at either one of these layers, it's all over the place. It's, uh, you know, different APIs will provide some mechanisms for an encryption library at a different layer, but what you'll ultimately find is when you get to the root of it, the encryption library itself is a library that you interact, that an application interacts with to render that text. So it always exists at layer six. Questions? Yeah, you suck, Evan. Sure. I'm not, I have absolutely no idea, man. Um, you know, the reality is, you know, and as far as like comparing, you know, encryption protocols, so 
let's, let's, let, me, let me turn that a little bit on this, all right? So when we talk about encryption algorithms themselves, so you look at something like you'll read these headlines that say, you know, AES-256 compromised or something like that. Is it, AES, like, so I'm going to debunk something here because in all the research that I've done over the past year, I have not read anything that legitimately said that a particular encryption algorithm was compromised in a means other than what it was expected to be compromised in. So if you think about like AES-256, it is an encryption algorithm that's rated just like a safe is. Like how many hours a safe or something like that is rated in like how many hours does it take to burn through it or how many, you know, how many man hours does it take to break in. That's how they rate the protection mechanisms of like security gates and other things. Encryption is the exact same way. So to say that it's unbreakable is not how it was ever intended to be stated in the first place. It was about, like, if you have this big of a computer and you have this much time, you're going to be able to brute force or, or get your way into this. So the idea behind encryption technologies and encryption algorithms themselves is to make it so that the data is no longer valuable in the amount of time that it would take you to do it. And so you implement encryption algorithms based on the time to value of that particular piece of data or that particular piece of information. And so when we look back at those previous things, we can start to see why like AES-256 gets broken. No, like a particular implementation of it does because it fails to adequately address the security concerns or it allows some mechanism to be bypassed where AES-256 is not even entered into. Because if the data is in ciphertext, it should theoretically take however long it takes, you know, whatever that algorithm is rated in to, to break it. Most of the time, it's poor implementation or a misimplementation of a particular algorithm. Now, can't get into that. That stuff is going to happen. That's not really the intent. What we're going to what we're going to do is we're going to make some assumptions here, and we're going to we're going to trust that these algorithms are written and protect data in a manner as described, and that we're going to um, trust that we can use them. So let, let's kind of talk about this layer. So we're like I said, we're going to look at this non ubiquitous layer where developers and applications where the data that we, we're interested in interacting with resides. Um, and, and we're going to look at some of the things that are in place right now to protect applications. So we're kind of getting into this thing that we were talking about. So we have all this different stuff. So if, presentation if the presentation layer is where encryption exists, why, what's getting compromised? And the reality is, is that we either compromise sessions where we're reading data before it's you know, encrypted, or we're um, interacting and, and able to, to forge who we are for purposes of retrieving that information, or we're going to look at data you know, that we're able to extract it out of um, you know, application space, memory space, and things like that. So if we look at, we started doing some research in, into the different protection mechanisms that are in place for modern operating systems and things like that. So you've got things like ASLR, uh, address space layer randomization, uh, I think that's what it's called, SE hop, you know, certificate pinning, all these different types of things that are in place for Protection of applications, uh, so things like sandboxing uh, are, are pretty typical and common things. But all of this, when they're in, those, in that layer, when they're in the application layer, they're almost always rendered in clear text, right? That's why I can use things like memory scrapers and, you know, the, what is it, the POS malware and all that type of stuff to get credit card numbers and all that type of stuff out of, out of memory. And when it comes down through this next layer, it may or may not be encrypted. So when you look at... Uh, um, like we trust SSL, right? SSL is a session layer encryption mechanism, so it doesn't get encrypted technically until it goes in transit. So now I'm lowering that level, like I'm allowing unencrypted data down into a lower level of memory space and, and session space that theoretically it shouldn't go to, right? Anybody following me here? Does that make sense? Um, so then we talk about things that are at, at a lower level, so um, things like user authentication, um, user access control, AAA services, like where do those things terminate? Well, they terminate at the session layer. So you, you can make some assumptions or you can make some comments about it. I'm, I'm, it's not really the point of this presentation. You know, there's an element of like, do you trust that these things to work if they're implemented and that type of thing? You know, if you properly choose these, you know, they provide some level of protection. But ultimately, the, the, the myth of, of encrypted data is, is that you know, yeah, those things, if, if you were encrypting data in the right way and that when it went up to the next layer, it was either rendered as ciphertext, you know, you know, if it was done right, if this process was followed correctly, then theoretically those things, you know, if, if it was to get compromised at the session layer, it would have been encrypted already, right? So a little theoretical here, but we go back to that, what we just talked about a second ago, which was that the attacks themselves 
on encryption are not coming at encryption themselves. They're coming at the various mechanisms above and below the presentation layer. And so ultimately, the failure of this is not encryption. Ultimately, the failure of it's not the application. The failure is, is that everything implements it differently. Um, there is no standard for how encryption is implemented within applications or within operating systems themselves. And so we have this aspect of interpretation that, that can be taken. Um, so, so the kind of the, the piece of this that we, that we kind of got into was just like, how can we create something that would be, um, or how can you interact with this data in, in some format that would be, um, you know, a, a little bit more straightforward. So you've got this, this aspect of the session, you know, you've got your interfaces and services, web services, you know, Apache or whatever you're running, and you have encryption libraries, like I said, AES-256 may be a library, you have your application libraries, you know, your Java portlets and other things, like that, or whatever they are, I'm not a developer, so, you know, but you've got all your API level stuff that's there that makes development to, pr to provide your application or provide your service a little bit easier. And then you've got things like up at the higher level layers that are, you know, application sandboxing, for, for instance, here is kind of a standard deal. Um, follow me still? Evan, you suck. Um, so what if we kind of, you know, took this and provided something, instead of having it there, what if we provided something a little bit more standard that said, um, you know, we can't block access to encryption libraries, we can't block access to these different things, and we wouldn't necessarily want to, but what if we provided a, a library that was standard for a particular operating system that was open source, just like a lot of libraries are, that allowed a means to interact in a consistent way that would mean that data coming and going from it would be encrypted the right way. Theoretical, right? Um, what, what, what would this solve, or would this solve anything? And the reality is it solves some of it, most of it maybe, but about half of it. Um, you know, we have to provide a means for these applications, you know, for, for, can we separate, you know, what's viewed by the application, and, or what's viewed by the user, and then what's used by the application, because in most instances, those are pretty different things, right? You know, a, a, you know like in a Word document, the, the clear text that you're talking, that, you know, when you type your text into the Word document, a very, only a very little bit of that is really important. All the rest of it's the, you know, the crap, the formatting, you know, stuff that's in it, and all this other type of stuff. What if I could just encrypt that part, the part that the application doesn't necessarily need to see, you know, for purposes of interacting with it? It can still do the rest of its stuff with all these other libraries and other stuff, but, like, any time that we interact with human-generated data or things like that, can we provide a means to, enter, you know, for applications to interact with it in a standard way so that I can protect my information, but the application can still do its job, and, and you know, and, and I can protect the, that stuff going up and down? Any... Takers, nobody. All right. So we still have to provide a means for some of this stuff to happen. So like the library itself can still interact with standard encryption libraries. So we're not locking ourselves into a particular um, encryption mechanism. Those libraries and other things can continue to interact at layer six um, uh, to do what they need to do. And layer five can interact with you know the sessions and services and other things to create things. Theoretical, right? Um, what if we what if what if type of scenarios? But the reality is like something like this could theoretically work and it could provide some level of protection. Uh, and then the application, you know, the six and a half application or the library itself provides data back in a standard format for, you know, human interacted data uh, or, or non-application interactive data that, uh, that would go back to the app library and it would continue to get processed. Um, so, preparation H. A through G were total failures. Um, so we started looking around at like what's out there already, what kind of provides some of this stuff, and we're going to get into a handful of things. And this is where, um, if you if you if you haven't taken your no dos, this may be a good time. Um, it's going to get a little bit more complicated uh, from here on out. So we have some of these different uh, kind of like what's out there already, and how do how do things interact? So let's talk about first about session layer stuff and how we identify users and. Um, how do we provide mechanisms for um, secure user authentication interaction and stuff like that? And so um, we talked about the framework. Now we're going to kind of talk about a process framework uh, at this point. And, and we're kind of jumping around here. I hope it starts to make sense towards the end. Otherwise, uh, where are those little darts looking for you? Um, so metadata, or when we talk about this, we've got some different standard stuff that we, we deal with every day is like role-based authentication kind of a standard mechanism for how users are, are paired with data, but we see that that terminates at like a session layer. So the idea in like Active Directory, for example, is that if I'm a member of a particular group, then I have access to anything that that group has access to. And it kind of doesn't take into account much of anything else. Um, so 
you know, then we talk about like how do we, some of these other aspects of things like mandatory access control, like, you know, I can have access, I can be a member of a group, but if I don't have this other mandatory piece like, uh, you know, secret, top secret, whatever, then I, then I can't access data up and down. And so I'm not going to get into like how all of this works, but hopefully you kind of understand the concept. Some of the newer stuff that's coming out that is out there already is like attribute based. And so when we talk about um, attribute based, some of the, some of these different types of, uh, information and, and kind of what I kind of drew some lines out here like metadata like where does the information for this stuff come from what are some current implementations or what are some current things that you can think about like how do I get the context or how do I get information to do this type of authentication and so some of the things like attribute based where you know we talk about like geo specific stuff that if you're in a particular location you have you're allowed access to this data or whatever um, those types of things come into play and so these are some technologies that aren't necessarily implemented in wide scale or, or maybe have some very specific uses. Uh, Geofencing or something like that may be an example. So kind of think about it in that aspect, this attribute-based stuff. Um, you've got metadata, PKI stuff that um, trust-based uh, risk reputation type of stuff where like if I want to allow data or I want to allow um, authorization to access particular resources based on some type of, um, you know, interaction that I provide based on trust or repute. This is very, you know, new stuff that's coming out and people are trying to work with a lot. But like, what's in the middle of all of that? You know, we've got this crazy Venn diagram up there that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And so, um, you know, what if we kind of took some of the pieces of this and said like, what if we had like attribute based access control and kind of combined trust and, and trust based and reputation based access, access control. It creates this concept and, and something that, uh, that we talked about, I talked about very briefly in the presentation last year is this concept of a policy decision point. So let's think about the policy decision point from an aspect of it's, it's not just managing, we're no longer just managing users, but we have to manage access to attribu attributes and other things and data and so forth. And so uh, a policy decision point creates, it's kind of like Active Directory or, or like any type of directory services utility that applies policy, but it's based on a larger subset of data instead of just users and groups and things like that. Follow me? No. Um, so this is a slide from last year uh, that I wanted to kind of skim over very quickly because I'm going to run out of time. Um, some of the concept of, of this ubiquitous cloud, the idea to store store anywhere, available everywhere. Um, what if we could, you know, have some of these things like trust-based repute and, and other types of uh, things, multiple algorithms that, that the framework that's not dependent on a particular al algorithm to be successful because there are different benefits of using different levels of algorithms based on speed or performance or whatever it may be. Um, so we can't lock that in. Um, we don't want to create anything. We, we need to use and leverage things that are already existing out there. We're not trying to create the next layer of something. Uh, but we can also, something that could take advantage of things like data tagging and journaling and all this other type of stuff and support for all those different multiple access control methodologies that we talked about before. So we can't lock anybody out, but we want to provide a mechanism or a benefit to bringing those, th those newer protocols and technologies in. Um, sounds pretty difficult. So we kind of started looking around and said, what's out there already? So there's a buttload of IETF, RFCs, and other things. All these standards, and if you, if you think this talk is boring, oh my god. Go read some of that stuff. Um, but each of these kind of provides something that's a little bit different. So we've got some things like these, you know, media type for reputation, interchange, geographic, you know, location data. What they're talking about is providing standards for identifying how applications can standardize the presentation or standardize the, we'll just call it presentation. It's not necessarily a presentation layer library or anything like that, but like a format of what does a geo, like a standard geo information header look like and stuff like that. So these are things that kind of come into play if we want to try to make data um, to integrate some of this, this data into our uh, authentication decisions and our access decisions and our encryption decisions and all these other types of things. Um, all right, and then I kind of wanted to stop here for a minute because I know that this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, as my buddy Tom sitting in the seat here can tell you, um, it was kind of a beautiful mind moment that I had uh, in a hotel room and I started like writing all over the mirror with a freaking, uh, you know, expo marker and they start calling the people with the, you know, the white jackets and stuff and, and they think I'm going crazy. But um, the concept that we kind of got to last year was this, what if I could create scalable per file PKI designed for this concept of ubiquitous computing, right? We're talking about going to the cloud and how everything will just be application to application. I don't care about devices, you know, Google Chrome, for example, right? You know, your save tabs. I don't, you know, I can literally go on my iPhone and then go to my computer and the tabs are all the same and all these things. 
you know, how do you think that's happening? It's, you know, the applications are talking to each other. It's PFM. Um, so, but provides us with a means for active access control. And the reason this becomes important is because right now, everything that we have as far as most access control mechanisms are completely retroactive. They are not, they do not protect you into the future. They do not make smart decisions necessarily based on the latest bit of information that's coming into them, whether it be GOIP or repute information or anything else. It's not to say that they can't. There are some people that are trying to do it, and they fail massively. That's why we have data loss prevention technologies, and those work so well. Um, anybody implement those, DLP? Yeah. Have fun with that. Um, so what if we could provide something that's a little bit smarter than DLP that actually allows us to block something before it happens? Um, so we have some things like active access control, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to keep going. Uh, don't have too much time to go into this, but we, I showed this slide last year, um, and I just wanted to kind of um, go through it for purposes of kind of showing, um, you know, we have applications that are protected. Oh, good Lord, go. Um, how users interact with applications. They generate data. They have identities that they're interacting with multiple devices in. They create data. Uh, you know, we start to encrypt this data in context of domain and, and user identity instead of encrypting it for purposes of like dropping it to a file system, that data ownership and other things can be managed by a policy decision point that could be specific to an individual user, um, where the user can make decisions on their own about how that data is accessed and shared and um, you know, where you can control. That's the concept of this talk, which is allow myself to encrypt myself. How can I maintain ownership of my data? How can I prevent, you know, still interact with the Facebooks and the other applications that I want to interact with, but not necessarily provide them any information. I can use their application. I can generate data in context of that application, but still ultimately control what they can and can't see. And that sounds pretty crazy. Like, how do you, how do you do that? But there, there are, you know, some interesting, like I said, we, we've kind of outlined some of the ways that that could work. Um, the next piece of this is that we, we kind of debunked or kind of threw out this concept that I have to keep that encryption keys, public-private keys, are specific to users or applications or devices even. What if I were to give, um, what if I were to give public-private keys to contexts, to attributes in my uh, architecture? What if I were to um, encrypt things in the context of a role or a user role? And so a domain can own uh, you know, a domain role can own the public-private keys and encrypt things specific or in context to it. And because it owns those keys, it can prevent data loss, right? You know, if, if you come and request that data, you have to request an unencrypted copy or a, a re-encrypted copy of the data. Um, so let, let's look at this. So what if public-private keys were more than just systems and users? What if, uh, you know, and I get this argument, some people are going to talk about what, what about the overhead of, of this stuff? The reality is all this stuff is really happening in the background where people are appending data and encrypting between services. So I, I'll, if you have time, I can tell you why that's complete bull crap. Um, what if keys were disposable just like sessions that if a key gets compromised, I don't care because I'm just going to, you know, the data ownership of it is still in context of a, uh, of a user, of a domain, um, just like you have with, you know, any other encrypt or authentication mechanism that you have. And what if we provided a simple mechanism to, to regenerate encryption keys uh, so that we can take into this concept that, that things are automatically, um, things are automatically, uh, you know, that, that they're going to get compromised, right? So um, this is the patent. Um, last year we went through, and, and, and I know this looks like insanity. I'm going to try to go through it in about like five minutes worth of time, which they're telling me I have. Um, so last year out of the talk, we, we we had some guys come up to us and they were like, you can't talk about this, you need to protect this stuff. And I did not necessarily see that at all. I had no idea why anybody would, you know, we were throwing out crap and seeing what stuck. But so one of the things that this kind of takes into account, we kind of hit on each of these and, and I'm going to try and draw it together here in the last five minutes. And um, you have this concept of a trust domain, which is most what most of us interact with. And this is the most common type of, of domain, right, where you have users and devices, you have roles and identities and things like that that you interact with and you generate data in the context of. And so I know that that's kind of small and stuff, but really what we're showing is that a user interacts, you know, what creates an identity ultimately for a user is the interaction of multiple devices, a device and application, and a user login and things like that. And then I can, you know, in the context, I log into a domain, um, you know, some type of AAA or something like that, and I, you know, have a uh, user identity interaction and, and all these different types of things as you kind of go down through this process. And so ultimately these are 
you know, this is kind of the shift where, and, and the reason that devices and applications are outside of this trust domain is the concept that, you know, BYOD, for example, I'm no longer just, these devices don't necessarily belong to an organization. They're ubiquitous, right? I, I'm coming and going from them, and, and organizations are allowing you to bring your, you know, own assets and things like that into the workplace. So that, that aspect of those devices is becoming less and less relevant. So what if we don't care about the devices? What if we don't trust them? Um, so we, we talk about, then we have data domains. And so we understand data domains. There are existing things out there. So we have got abstracted data fields. So you have data fields and types that tie together to create objects and models. And then you can create policy based off of, you know, if this IP plus this, um, you know, social security number plus this, whatever, you know, you can start to create data models and relate objects to each other and they create context. Um, like I said, not going to get into that too much because there's, there's stuff there, but we're seeing this shift to kind of, uh, you know, some of this user-defined stuff, so like data tagging within operating systems where you can create, regardless of where that data sits in the operating system, you can have a, a tag or a context that brings it all together and makes it relate to you. Um, so that's there. Um, it, it can get really granular. It cannot be. So if you think about Gmail labels, like how do they, um, how do they create those labels for you automatically? That's, it literally can be that simple, uh, how you create policy on these things. Um, so what if we extended this schema, we took that idea of providing keys to more than just, um, you know, individual things, we provide it to policies and users and devices and all this other type of stuff. And we've got things like key management and stuff like that. It, it makes things much more, uh, much more flexible. Um, what if we, you know, and it also starts to provide this, this aspect of where we can do like real trust-based modeling. So we can extend the, the amount of data that we can control access based on and that type of stuff. I'm going to talk about this, how the data protection domain kind of works. Um, I'm going to publish some of this stuff up, and um, like I said, I'm, I'm going through this very, very fast. I probably should have gone through the beginning stuff a lot faster. But um, in a data protection domain, so it's kind of the bridge between trust and data domains. And so you create a context for how data is interacted with and how data gets encrypted and unencrypted. And so you aggregate this policy. You can provide uh, extended schema protection. So, like, if you want to, some some of the one of the basic things that we talk about is inference-based attacks and stuff like that. You know, if I'm providing, you know, how do I search for metadata or how do I search for data inside of encrypted data and some of those things. Um, if you've got questions, uh, I'll bore the death, you know, bore you to death on that stuff. But continuing to talk about data protection domains, um, you have. You know, data is published in the context of each individual application or each individual piece that's requesting that data. So we talk about those verticals of devices and applications and other things. Each of those have encrypted data based on the public-private keys for that particular instance of, of that piece of data. So it provides a much more robust and less revealing piece of, of data encryption you know, so that the device only ever sees things that it absolutely needs to see to perform its function. So. The last piece of this that, uh, that I'll really get into is, is process pipes. And the aspect of process pipes in the framework are to allow existing technologies and future technologies to interact with the framework. And the reality is, is that we have no idea how we're going to use this in the future. We have no idea what applications are going to exist and what context we're going to want to interact with data, uh, how data is going to get generated and so forth. Um, you know, existing AAA services that are here now aren't going to be here in the future and so forth. So what the framework gets away from it. So we, we provide um, in multiple places aspects for process pipes to interact with data, to provide like context for data loss prevention technologies or things like that, to tag data and so forth. Um, so we're staying away from identity and access management, that's a process pipe. We're staying away from end user and certificate management. Those tools and technologies exist, that's a process pipe. Data and storage and transport, those processes exist. We're not talking about those things. We're talking about how to put them all together in a framework that allows you to protect your data and allows you to control your data and the aspect of how it's used in the future. So one of the things that I had talked about last year was like data destruction through certificate revocation. And the idea is that all this data is created with certificates that are managed by the, the policy decision point. And so if I realize that data has been compromised or maybe I see like a virus or a piece of malware is running around my network, I can instantly kill access to that piece of malware by revoking the certificate because it has to have a certificate to be reversed and opened up into clear text to operate, right? Anybody follow me? I'm going really fast here. Um, uh, so what does it do? It provides some practical uh, protection mechanisms. The framework assumes compromise, right? Like, so all I've got to do is just revoke these certificates and the data goes away, right? But that could have negative impacts as well. Um, but we can re-encrypt data. So, but what the biggest thing is that it, that it talks about is that it requires more than just compromising a user's identity. 
um, you would, you know, it's very easy to, uh, you would have to compromise multiple aspects of the technology in multiple places to, to really get access to all the data to put it in complete context. And so, it's kind of a small slide there, but some of the things that asymmetric encryption, I'm going to breeze through this, and pro, you know, provides confidentiality, uh, man in the middle protection, so some of the things like SSL and other um, symmetric ciphers are vulnerable to. Um, it, it provides a level of protection above that. Gives you integrity and non-repudiation, which you do not have in current encryption uh, implementations. Uh, so it actually allows you to know what device, what user, what application, all those different things that are important to you to, de to develop true context and, IP and reputation policy. Um, and it also could require online access so that, uh, you know, if somebody steals your data now and they take it off site and they want to crunch it, they can't open it uh, because they have to come back to you to get that data uh, or to get the, you know, approved unencrypted version of that data, re-encrypted version of that data. Uh, metadata tagging, uh, custom policy and context, journaling, uh, machine-based ontology limits data exposure and inference attacks. Um, and this is, I, I put this, this in here on purpose, I've gone cross-eyed. Um, if you're not ready to kill yourself now. Uh, so obviously some of the things that are still there, you have to protect the keys, but what we're providing is a mechanism where keys and key exposure is a little bit less important. Um, so some of the things that, that we ran into pretty early when we started trying to test this was like impractical data types. So like how do I encrypt you know, streaming video or audio or something like that? Maybe I do or don't care. But the reality is that we've, we've kind of come up with some ways. So what makes like symmetric key ciphers vulnerable to attack is you know, intercepting the symmetric cipher on one end or the other. But what if I used, um, you know, so those ciphers are much more efficient. You know, I'm not going to send every single video packet, you know, PKI encrypted. That would be very inefficient. But what if I exchange that symmetric key with those private keys? That instantly allows me a little bit higher level of protection. I know I have that non-repudiation and stuff like that in the endpoints. You know, yeah, it's still vulnerable to replay attacks, but maybe that's, you know, that's worth it. Um, processing network overhead, we're talking about the future here, right? We're not going to have memory and disk space and other problems in the future, I know. Um, yes, there are tons of problems and tons of cool things to solve with this. Um, one thing that I didn't get to talk about last year was how do you attack the framework? Um, and this was, this was the biggest thing that people came up to us afterwards was the second piece was patent trolls. And until we started looking, we, we had no idea, we didn't really consider this concept as patentable, um, but apparently it is. And so, that's the biggest vulnerability that I have right now is exposing you know, a concept framework to you guys um, that somebody could then take and potentially patent and lock it down and prevent all of us from, from doing things with it. So, but more likely, things that are gonna be, uh, that are gonna be attacked is people are gonna try to attack the rules, attack the libraries, you know, DOS is always a big deal. Um, race condition attacks, uh, I don't have time to talk about them, but it's the concept uh, that uh, you know, I can, uh, if I can, steal the data and compromise the keys before you can revoke them, you know, whatever that t finite time period is that I can then get access to all your data. So I'm going to blow through this. Um, some of the things that we're using to test this, web ontology languages, uh, attribute-based access control. Um, anybody that knows me will tell you I drink a lot of Red Bull, and dang it, and I have yet to grow any wings. Yeah, you got to love that, like, auto advancing slide type of deal. So, um, to keep you guys up to date, come on. Um, provisional patent protection is there and in place since uh, um, last year. Um, the, the reason I mention this is that I ha I'm not an expert in this stuff, so I need some help. Um, you know, currently we're researching some of the most appropriate mechanisms to, uh, to release this as a uh, open source framework that people could, could leverage. So, on that note, um, I ran out of time, as I always do, because I like to talk too much. Um, but uh, I know it was good for Adrian. He left. Um, but uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, I appreciate you guys listening and listening to me ramble. Um, some of the guys that contributed last year that were really uh, influential and in, in kind of you know, advancing us to go uh, to take this and, and get a patent and things like that so that, that the community could continue to use it um, and to advance this concept. Um, so. But anyways, thanks, guys. Go. Uh, doesn't also lie on the session layer. Can you tell me why not? Okay, the reason it doesn't rely on the session layer is because the session layer has to enter, like it has to take the data that it's receiving, run it through an encryption library, and bring it back. So like you're rendering clear text into ciphertext and sending ciphertext out. So like even your session layer application is taking it and putting it through some type of presentation layer 
you know, library to render it into a format that it can then, inter you know, can send and interact with the se uh, session layer protocols in. Oh, I see. But uh, isn't the session layer also important in encrypting ourselves? Now, not in the framework we presented. I, I mean now. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's always there. Like the, the reality is, is that you like know, SS, SSH and all this stuff. Yep. The the reason, though, ultimately those are compromised is because data enters. Like data is unencrypted at SSH. Like it doesn't get encrypted until the session layer receives the clear text data, yeah. sends it back to an application library, and receives it again. So instead of it always being like never going below the presentation layer encrypted, like that's that's where the man in the middle attacks kind of come into place. Is because if I can intercept it either above the presentation layer or below it. Those are the vulnerabilities. So how can I oh. keep data in the application stack encrypted for as long as absolutely possible? That's what this the concept of the application framework is about. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, we've got time for, for one more question. Are you concerned at all about something like uh, governmental regulations saying that they have to backdoor it so that the NSA or the CIA or the FBI can read and subpoena the data? The data? A absolutely, and, and the reality is that there is absolutely no way that I could do that. Um, because the, the idea is that this is just a framework. We're not providing an encryption algorithm. We're not providing any mechanisms for people to encrypt themselves. We're not exporting anything that would be controlled, all that type of stuff. Right. But it could be a practical limitation in terms of how the government regulates this sort of implementation, saying that Google has to always backdoor it or something like that, right? Theoretically, they could. But the ultimately, just like PGP and just like a lot of these other ones, like if we as a user community provide our own mechanism to do this. So like, yeah, if you want to trust Google to provide you with this, you know, service or whatever, absolutely. I mean, they can, you're trusting them that they're doing the right thing with your data. But the idea of the framework is, is that it's open and anybody can use it to, to create their own, um, you know, key server and key management and policy decision point and that type of stuff. Um, you know, the process pipes are, they are designed into the framework on purpose so that you can interact with the data or that you can, you know, provide data in a format that uh, that is practical to your implementation, but doesn't lock you out of using other applications and services. Great. Well, we have to leave it there um, with our tin foil hats firmly in place. Um, if anyone has any other questions, then feel free to hit Evan up.